some places. First, we are going to look at Acts chapter 2, verses 16 to 21. This is the day of Pentecost uh, when the disciples were in the upper room and uh, they had been... uh, had the Holy Spirit poured out upon them, and Peter had gotten up and spoken. And this is Peter when he says, This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so I just wanted to read that passage also from Joel chapter 2, verses 28 to 32. The day of the Lord. And afterwards, Joel says, I will pour out my spirit. This is him speaking, the Lord speaking through Joel. I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit on those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the survivors whom the Lord calls. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And so you'll see today we are speaking about the Holy Spirit. And this is what Jesus had said about uh, the Holy Spirit in the Gospel of John. Jesus said, when the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you must also testify, for you have been with me from the very beginning. But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. For about sin, because people do not believe in me. And about righteousness, because I am going to the Father, where you can no longer see me. And about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. And he will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me, because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is now mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. Now this was Jesus speaking to his disciples of how the Holy Spirit would come once Jesus had been put to death. And Jesus is also telling them that the Holy Spirit would teach them what they needed to know in order to testify to the truth of not only God the Father, but of who Jesus was as the Messiah. But the Holy Spirit had already been around for centuries. This was not the first that the Holy Spirit was going to come. In fact, the Holy Spirit had been around from the very beginning of time. If we open the Bible, Genesis chapter 1 confirms this truth with these first two verses. It says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God 
the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Now, throughout history in the Old Testament, we find that the Holy Spirit was often given by God to the prophets so that they could foretell of things that were to come. And they would also warn the Jewish people of their hard hearts and their unfaithfulness to God. And he would have them turn back to worship God when they had strayed away. But the Holy Spirit was not upon all of the people. God would instead choose only select people to be anointed with the Holy Spirit. Men such as Isaiah and Jeremiah, Amos and Joel, as we heard. God would even choose women such as Rahab and Deborah and Esther to be anointed to do his will. Now often we have heard the Holy Spirit being described as fire, as the symbol fire. And even John the Baptist said, I will baptize with water those who repent of their sins and turn to God. But someone is coming who is greater than I am so much greater that I'm not even worthy to be his slave and to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And on the day of Pentecost, we are told that the Holy Spirit was ushered into the upper room with a sound like that of a mighty rushing wind, and suddenly tongues of fire appeared over the head of each person in that room, and they soon began to prophesy. So here again, we see the Holy Spirit associated with fire. But today, in our passage, it didn't quite sound like the Holy Spirit was being described as fire, did it? Instead, it was almost like he was being described as water. And this is true, for we know that the Holy Spirit is present through the waters of our baptism. This would lead us to believe that God has in the past only given small and isolated anointings of the Holy Spirit to those he chooses, almost like little drops of water on those people and those prophets whom God had chosen. But not today. In our passage, it was not just drops of the Holy Spirit or even a sprinkling of the Holy Spirit. In our passage today, he says, I will pour out my spirit. When you pour something, that means you are getting a larger amount than if you were just sprinkling something. God is pouring out his spirit. God is giving it all to us and not just to a select few of us as in the Old Testament. No, we all now have the opportunity to have the Holy Spirit, each and every one of us. The Apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost was quoting this passage of Scripture found in the Old Testament from the prophet Joel that we've seen. And when he said, afterwards I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. It said, even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heaven and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and Jerusalem there will be deliverance, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. You see, the phrase afterwards, when he says, afterwards I will pour out my spirit, is the same as the meaning in the last days. Both of these phrases refer to the days of the Messiah. So Joel was predicting way back then, this day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit would be poured out on the believers. But even Joel and Peter, in reciting this prophecy, still did not quite understand what it was that they were speaking. They didn't quite understand the meaning of how the Spirit would be poured out on all people. Both of them, especially Peter, would think that all meant all of the Jewish people, all of God's chosen people. They do not think that all, in this instance, includes the Gentiles. It was understood that the Spirit will be poured out upon all of the Jewish people. They understood that. That was an understanding 
That was God's chosen people. They knew that they would have the Holy Spirit. But Peter and those gathered in the upper room witnessed the Holy Spirit being poured out on both the old and the young, the male and the female. They didn't understand that soon it would not only be the Jewish people. You see, Peter would not realize this in full until this uh, passage that we had preached on a few weeks ago when he saw the white sheet full of the animals coming down in front of him. And the Lord had said, Go ahead, Peter, kill and eat whatever you like. And then Peter had realized that some of those were unclean. And then Peter afterwards that same day went to the home of Cornelius, a Gentile, and there he witnessed to him and the Holy Spirit fell upon Cornelius and his entire family, both the family and the servants alike. You see, God is no respecter of persons. He does not care about the social status or the age of a person. We will see that he also does not take into consideration the gender of the person. What God does take into consideration is the, that that person has knowledge of God and that they have a belief in God. The rest of this passage from Joel reads much like the breaking of the seals in the book of Revelations. As God prepares for that great day of judgment when he says about the moon will be turned to blood. You see, I came across this description of what that great day of judgment would be like. And this is how the Bible commentator Albert Barnes describes that day for us. He said, Christ with all of his angels will come down and sit on his throne. All who have ever lived or who shall live shall be placed before him to be judged. All thoughts, words, and deeds shall be weighed most exactly. On all a sentence will be passed, absolute, irrevocable, without, throughout eternity. The saints, the saints shall be assigned to heaven, the ungodly to hell. A great gulf shall be placed between them, which shall sever them forever, so that the ungodly shall never see the godly again, shall never see heaven, shall never see God, but shall be shut up in a prison forever and shall burn as long as heaven shall be heaven, or God shall be God. That day shall be great to the faithful, but terrible to the unbelieving. Great to those who said, truly this was the Son of God. But terrible to those who said, his blood be upon us and upon our children. When you are inclined then to sin, Albert says, think on that terrible and unendurable judgment seat of Christ where the judge sits on his lofty throne and all creation shall stand in all of his glorious appearing, and we shall be brought one by one to give an account of what we have done in life. Then those who have done much evil in life will be given over to their fate. There will be a deep gulf, an impassable darkness with a lightless fire, retaining in darkness the power to burn, but absent to give any rays of light. This also is where the poisoned and ravenous worm will devour and never be satisfied. But found there is also the sharpest punishment of all, and that is unending shame and everlasting reproach. You see, Albert Barnes warns us to fear these things, and by this fear, hold on tight to our souls as if with a bridle to keep away from the lust of evil. When I was asked about this scripture passage, it was thought that the meaning of the scripture being of the spirit being poured out on all the people meant that all of the people would eventually be saved in the last days before Christ returns. I think we see from this description of the great judgment day as well as 
this commentary by Albert Barnes that this is not the case. Instead, this passage refers to the fact that all people will have had the chance to hear the gospel and would have had the chance to come to believe or not believe according to their own personal decision. Sadly, many will choose not to believe. And I think that it is fair to say that there will always be those on earth who will not believe in Jesus Christ for one reason or another. But all will have had the chance to choose. And any who choose Jesus will not be turned away. You see, God has left us with an everlasting promise. And that is how Joel finishes out his passage as he reminds us when he says, And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and Jerusalem there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. But this promise is not found just in Joel. For this promise is also an echo of what the Apostle Paul wrote in his letter to the Roman church in what we know as Romans 10, 9 to 13. When Paul wrote, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the, bit, from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess your faith and are saved. For as scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew or Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You see, it's as simple as that. It's something that we don't have to jump through hoops to accomplish. We don't have to have some kind of big and complicated thing that needs done. It is as simple as believing in your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that Jesus died on the cross to give you life. We have just learned that God wants you, young or old, male or female, to come to him. You belong to him. He created you, and so he doesn't want to see you separated from the rest of his family on that great day of judgment. God wants to ensure that you are accounted for and that you are with him for eternity. Perhaps you're still not sure. If that's the case, don't put it off, for I believe that we are truly in the last days. God has poured out his spirit among us, to testify to our spirit that is within us as to the truth of who he is. And Jesus has promised to return, and we know that he keeps his promises. Jesus also said that he didn't know the day or the time when he was returning. And so, neither do we. And so we must be ready at all times. If you have not already given your life to Jesus, I invite you to come forward during our last song and I will pray with you for Jesus loves you and he wishes everyone to come to him. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, pour out your spirit upon us gathered here. May your spirit wash over us who are gathered and quench us with the refreshing and renewing life that is only found through you. Today we remember and we give thanks for the life of your son Jesus who was poured out for us so that we might be filled with the gift of your salvation. May we too be raised one day to eternal life. And may your spirit continue to witness to us and to all of your people everywhere so that all would choose you. Empower each of us, your sons and daughters, to not only dream dreams and see visions, but to also prophesy and to go boldly forth proclaiming the truth 
of your promises to others. Amen.